So I'm a robot. Just gonna tell you that starting off right now. But my story kind of starts like this. It was March of 2014. It was the Friday of South by Southwest Interactive. And I had a meeting. I wanted the job. It's that job that you really, really want. And you're starved for it, you're craving for it. And you, in your mind, you're the best candidate for the job. You're sold. You've sold yourself and it is game on. And that job for me was the STEM marketing position at National Instruments. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And so in my head, I was like, this is game on. I've got this. Did interview number one, interview number two, and I had this third meeting the Friday before South by Southwest Interactive. And I take South by Southwest off. I take vacation for it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go to this meeting. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to land this job. And I'm going to go celebrate with friends. We're going to listen to great music and have a couple of drinks. And it's going to be wonderful. As I'm sitting there at my desk, I'm reading this article from Wired. And it's called The Year of the Robot. And basically, the short of it is, is it says that 2014 and moving onward is going to be this wonderful cross intersection where the acceptance of robots is going to grow, but also the availability and the purchase, i.e., they kind of leaned on the idea of Arduino and the Google car and all these other exciting things. Really awesome article. So I'm reading this article as I'm sitting at my desk. And in my mind, I'm reviewing my own personal resume. In 2012, I had a friend of mine. Her name is Jenny Mojica. And she had asked me to go volunteer and teach robotics. And she says, listen, I know you got a lot on your plate and you do a lot of things, but you really should consider going out to this fifth grade class and volunteering. All you have to do is show up once. And if you don't like it, you can walk away. So I was like, all right, Jenny, fine. And she'd been asking me for years. I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll go ahead and make this happen. And then she calls me up and she says, hey, better yet, the location is seven minutes from your house. And I was like, all right, all right, I'll do it, I'll do it. So I show up and I fall in love with these kids. Go Valley Elementary is a school on the east side near Pleasant Valley in 12th. It's in a low income area. 95% of the kids are on free and reduced lunch. And these kids are wonderful. They're beautiful, they're excited, they want to learn. And robots to them is just kind of this world outside of school where they get to actually implement what's happening in the structured environment. So we worked with these kids, we went to a tournament with First Lego League. First Lego League, if you've never experienced it, has this ethos that basically says it's not about whether we win or whether we lose, but it's about what we learn along the way. It's this journey that we take. So this team in particular went ahead and took a robot, this one right here at the bottom of the page, and this little blue thing, which is kind of hard to see right now, is actually a cargo truck. And what they were trying to do is take this cargo truck to an airplane autonomously, and they were working on natural disasters and how to save people. And you have to do this under a timed environment, two and a half minutes, and do this three times. And they also do presentations and other great stuff like that. The team did really well. First year, rookie, rookie season, rookie team, they come out of the gate, they're roaring. They win the first tournament. Second tournament, thank you. I mean, yeah, it was exciting. I was excited too, woo! Second tournament, we lost, but in the end, we knew something awesome had happened because it's not about whether we win or whether we lose, but it's about what we learn along the way. In 2013, National Instruments, where I work, has a conference called NI Week. We ran out the Austin Convention Center during the hottest week of the year, which is the first week in August, and we invite 4,000 people to, from across the globe to come and sweat with us here in Austin. And it's a wide array of academics, scholastics, scientists, engineers from, a, from across the arena, everywhere you can imagine, audio to RF, mobile devices, semiconductor, and it's a blast. It's a good time. Well, this particular year, I got to meet our friend Nicole Richard, who's sitting right here in the blue shirt. And the marketing team had come up to me before, and they said, hey, do you happen to know anyone, preferably a child, who would be willing to speak in front of 4,000 people? I was like, well. I don't know one offhand, but we're gonna find somebody. And so I went back to Go Valley Elementary and there was this kid, his name's David. He reminded me a lot about myself. He was a tiny little guy, shortest in his class, little in stature, big smile all the time, a little sheepish and real quiet. And so he spent his summer working with us, Nicole and myself, and learned how to program live. And I don't know if you've ever programmed while trying to talk to somebody, but that is a skill in itself. It is very hard. And so David kills it. He's on the NI Week stage in front of 4,000 people, and like a champ, hands raised in the air. Just awesome, having a good time. So that job, 
I'm sitting there, it's Friday, of Interactive South by Southwest, and I'm waiting on this meeting to go on vacation. So I walk into the meeting, sitting across the table, and they tell me, you know what, Antonio, you're really a prime candidate, but you're not the person we picked for the job. Devastation, right? You try and hold it together, you're like, oh yeah, sweet, well let me know if you need anything, your mind changes, you know, <laughs> it's no big deal, you know, we're, we can work together, it'll be fine. Man, get back to my desk, open up my laptop, I'm sitting there. And I, it's when you're looking at your email and you're just glazed, you're not really doing any work, but you're just kind of like, you're just watching them all flow in, nothing's happening for like 20 minutes. <laughs> it's the reality of the situation. So I did what any self-respecting Austinite would do. I closed my laptop at about 11.30, and I said, the heck with this, I'm gonna go out and get a drink, I'm gonna see friends, and we're gonna go listen to some live music. So, <laughs> so, so I left, I had a good time. I'm on vacation, I was like, we're just gonna forget about this, it's not a big deal. So, pick myself off the floor, you know, we're gonna make this happen, figure out what's gonna happen next in the world of Antonio, because it's just kind of like this potpourri of excitement just kind of fluttering everywhere. And that's when I get a phone call. I get a phone call from our philanthropy manager. Her name is Amanda Webster. And Amanda says, hey, wanted to chat with you about something. I'm like, yeah, go ahead, hit me. She says, do you want to go to Vietnam? I was like, sure, what does it cost? And she's like, no, no, and I's going to pay for it, and we want you to teach robotics in Vietnam. One of our board directors has an organization called the Sunflower Mission. And their goal is to build classrooms in other countries. She says that's how they're trying to impact Vietnam as Vietnamese Americans. It's like, all right, that sounds good. And in my head, I get off the phone, I'm like, I'm just this kid from El Paso. I kind of, you know, I, I don't know. In my mind, I, I graduated from high school, and then after graduating from high school, I went to college for a year or two, got really bored. So I was like, heck with this, we're gonna do rock and roll. And so I played rock and roll for a few years. And I taught during the regular school year, so that way I could have my summers off, and it was a blast. Lived the dream. After bands break up and people, you know, get upset about creative differences, I was like, all right, it's time to go to school. I gotta, I gotta saddle up and I gotta make something. So, moved to Dallas, go to school, get my engineering degree and make mom proud. So after that, after that, I, I end up at National Instruments and I love it. It, it. It's a blast. But I never really saw myself as somebody who would like travel out of the country and it was one of those things that I sat there and I said, I, I want to do this one day but I don't really know how it's going to happen. So here it is, it lands. And as I'm preparing for this trip, I get a phone call from Nicole. Nicole Richard, who was on the NI Week stage with David, and she says, hey, I have to go to India to work on some software because she's in charge of the, the Lego software program at National Instruments. It'd be really awesome if I went with you and I met up with you because Lillian from Lego, who's a buddy of mine who also works with me on that side of the software, we could all go together. It's like, wow, that sounds great. So after further talk, Nicole ends up telling me, she's like, oh, by the way, you know, my husband wants to come with us too, and it's because I'm pregnant. And I was like, rightfully so, you know, let's make sure everyone's safe. The one thing about Nicole that's amazing is Nicole's a doer. There's two kinds of people in this world. There's people that say what they're gonna do, and there's people that do, and Nicole does. So what Nicole had been doing for the last few years is she'd been going to Cambodia and India, working with several organizations on what she calls renegade trips. No real backing, just kind of gathering up robots and acquiring sponsorship as she could, and just going into orphanages and implementing these wonderful robotics programs. And since she wrote the software and was part of that team, I mean, you're basically like, it's the best of the best teaching that you can get. So here we are, the four of us on this trip, and we're strangers and we're friends. I didn't really know Lillian at all. This is Lillian from Lego out here on the outside. And then this is Nicole, and then her husband Andy, and myself. Now. If you look at the picture of me, you can see that this guy has never been out of the country as he is wearing his passport satchel <laughs> on the outside in an open market who's just excited to be eating squid. <laughs> you know? I'll, I'll never forget Andy and Nicole telling me at one point in time, they were like, you know, you could just tuck that into your shirt, it'll be all right. So, <laughs> I mean, just rookie all the way. So we decided our trip was going to go like this. We were going to start with a little bit of vacation. We were going to go to Thailand. We were going to eat our way through Thailand as much as possible and take cooking lessons. And then we're going to go to Cambodia and then to Vietnam. And then Lillian and Nicole would split off and go do their trip to India. Andy would fly home. 
and it'd be neat. We'd, I mean, we'd make new friends, it'd be fun, this wonderful little adventure. So we make our way after eating our way through Thailand and we end up in Cambodia. And there we meet a young lady by the name of Ponheri Lee. Ponheri Lee is this wonderful tiny woman, she's smaller than I am, she's about this big, and with twice as much energy as I've got, and an exceeding amount of passion. And the one thing that really came through about Poneri is that this woman's a giver with every bit of her being. As we're standing outside of this guest house, she's telling us about the trials and the tribulations that she's gone through and how she was working as a tour guide in Anger Wat, picking up tourists in Siem Reap, taking them through Anger Wat, and as she was standing there in Anger Wat, talking, talking to her tourist, she would have kids begging for you know, uniforms for school, wanting bicycles so that they can go to school. So then she thought, okay, well, if I start setting aside a little bit of money every single time I take a tour out, I can start helping out these kids. And then she wanted to approach the families and make sure there was some accountability. After some years, she starts driving herself into bankruptcy. And there's not a lot of money in Cambodia. And as she's on a tour one day, she sees these kids and they're begging to her. And the woman that's on the tour with her you know, says, you know, what can I do to help? And she says, Poneri says, well, when you go back to your country, you know, send us something so that way we can continue on helping our kids here because education's important. I mean, this, this country has been terrorized and we want to rebuild them up. And this is the best investment I can make in my country. So this woman, her name is Lori Carson. She heads back to Austin, Texas. And as she's there, she creates a foundation for her in her name, it's Poneri Lee Foundation goes back to, uh, to Cambodia and helps her work as a director and implements this. And now they're working in five different schools and hundreds of children. And there's this tier system where you get uniforms to go to school and then once you get to the third grade, we get you a bike, you know, and then it continues on. And then if you wanna go to college, we'll find you money for scholarship. It's beautiful, it's absolutely beautiful. And these kids are excited about learning. When we went to go teach these children, they were standing outside of the classroom at 6.45 for an 8.30 class. I mean, just, just waiting, just craving, which is so much fun and joy. So we decided that if we were gonna go to Cambodia and if we were gonna teach, we wanted to implement some sort of model because, I mean, we're just all, we're all just stranger friends and we're all on this trip. And so as we're doing this, we decided, okay, we wanna teach teachers to make this happen because if we invest in teachers, then they'll go ahead and continue on in the investment of their students afterwards. If we come in and we just throw a big pep rally and a big party, it's all just gonna end there. And so we wanna invest with the teachers for them to be excited about the power of what robotics has. And after we did that, we worked with the teachers on a handoff program. We would teach in the morning and then they would teach in the afternoon. And it's amazing how with the world of robotics or graphical programming, it just brings smiles to kids' faces. You don't even need a translator half the time. And these kids are just having a good old time. I love, I love these guys. One of the teachers there, his name is Saveth, and he's the media teacher, and he's still continuing on with this to this day. I chat with him about every three to four weeks on what support he needs. So after that, we went to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, the Sunflower Mission, their only goal is to build classrooms so that way their kids can be taught. And these kids, after we taught robotics, the following day they had this celebration for, for the opening of these classrooms. The little community that we're in is this, this fishing village where they have rats the size of cats. I mean, these things were huge, running through the lobby of the hotel. And, but these kids were just thrilled out of their mind to be receiving a backpack and a package of pens and pencils and highlighters so that way they could learn. I mean, it's just flabbergasting just the appreciation that they've got. And so we had a good time, and, and as we started to kind of put together this model, we started to really have fun. And just like I like to stretch here and run around and have a good time, we had a great time with these kids. We had an absolute blast. So as we're riding on these airplane trips through Cambodia and Vietnam and Thailand, we start talking about, this is, this is a blast, this is absolutely fun. There's, there's no currency that can bring me this kind of joy at all, at least in physical form of teaching these kids. And so the four of us decided to create Science in a Suitcase. And Science in a Suitcase, as an organization, almost wants to be transparent at times. We want to do the handoff to other organizations so that they can implement and ignite 
STEAM initiatives. And STEAM standing for science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. Because we feel that if you can merge this idea of logic and you can merge all the creativity on this side, then anything within your imagination is unstoppable. Absolutely unstoppable. It's the physicalness of what's going on in here and all the play and excitement, and you just merge it all together. So as we're running, we're blogging on LEGO's website, we're you know, pumping out stuff on Facebook, and we got friends liking pictures and all this other kind of stuff. And Andy, Nicole's husband, has this friend named Umar that he knows from college. And Umar ended up telling his buddy Theo, and Theo lives in a country called Suriname. Suriname is just north of Brazil. It's this tiny little, I shouldn't say tiny, that's not a fair word, but it's a, it's a, it's a Dutch-founded colony and country. Uh, they speak a variation of Dutch and English called Creole, and neat people, really exciting. What's neat about Theo is Theo is also one of those doers. And so when we start talking to him, we're like, tell us a little bit about your organization. He's like, okay, well, there's about 10 or 12 of us. We're not really a formal organization in the way you probably think of it. I really see us as a movement. And I was like, whoa, okay. And so Theo starts chit-chatting. He starts telling us about how he wants to make the next generation of Surinamese people powerful coders because he feels like if they have a grip on coding, they can really change their nation. I was like, man, let's do this. So we start chit-chatting. And he starts handing out dates, and we're looking at our calendar, and we're going back and forth. And we're about seven days out from when we're supposed to leave, and we don't think this trip is going to happen. And he calls us, and he says, OK, Suriname Airlines has sponsored your flights. Are you ready? And I was like, uh, sure. So immediately asked for vacation time, and we get on this plane. And it's, the funny thing is, is in, in Badi Madi Bol, which is the capital of Suriname, their airport is 45 minutes away from the actual city. So first of all, I haven't officially met, th met this guy yet. Lillen is flying in from Denmark. I'm flying in from Austin, Texas via, via Miami. And I get into town at about 1.45 in the morning. And all I know is, is that there's a guy, he's got my name on a sign. And it's like out of a movie, right? But I'm in a third world country. I mean, not quite third world, but I mean, I'm in another country. I don't know the land. And so he's holding this sign. And I walk up to him, I'm like, hi, I'm Antonio. And he waves and shakes my hand, and there's not really an exchange of language. And I'm like, OK. And I get into this van, and we drive for 45 minutes in the dark. No street lights anywhere. I mean, it was straight up out of like a thriller, you know, mystery movie. Anyways, and he drops me off at this beautiful hotel. And I was like, OK, you know, get out, check in. And we have a great time. The Surinamese people are thankful beyond belief. They, they live and walk with smiles on their faces almost 100% of the time. And so we took the same model. We wanted to go ahead and teach teachers, and they had 15 teachers lined up that we taught. And then after that, we were going to teach kids. And so we decided this time around, we were going to go ahead and divide up. We were going to teach some younger kids this platform that we call WeDo, and then some older kids a platform that we call EV3. And WeDo is a little bit more elementary, and then EV3 is the platform that David was a part of with the release with Nicole, and that platform ranges anywhere from upper level elementary school all the way into college classes. So here, these kids are actually learning we do programming through a graphical programming language. And then it, you can see these little birds that are down here. And in front of these little birds is actually a motion sensor. And so when you dance in front of these little birds, they start to dance. And so we started writing songs about being zookeepers and dancing with our little birds and what sounds do the lion make, rah, 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 and then we shake it and we have a great time and it's an absolute blast. So this is us acting like crocodiles before we start learning our new song. And we let the kids write the lyrics and then so we want to build on this story. And then at the end of it, we give them an open design challenge. And so for these particular kids, they were actually working on an appliance for Lillen's new loft. And so the story she tells them is, I don't have any appliances. I just moved into this place. You know, can you build me a new appliance? And these kids right here, in particular, were just amazing. The kid in the purple shirt, all their parents are there. There's about 60 parents. There's about 30 kids. And there's an MC who's talking in Dutch and who's going around to each group and explaining, OK, tell us a little bit about your application and what you built here for Lillen. Oh, well, I built a stove. And then tell us a little bit about yours. And so as, she, as the MC's going around, she goes up to this group. And in the middle of their presentation, their demo fails. Just the whole thing physically just crumbles. And with sheer confidence, the kid in the purple looks over and he says, listen, I really need you 
to go to the next group, and when you come back, this thing's gonna be working. I was like, bam, go get them. That's the way it should be. I loved it. And, and I mean, without fail, they walk over to the next group, he comes back, and I mean, that group had it solid. It was awesome. So I mean, just, just fun things like that to see kids have the confidence to want to create and do things. After that, we did EB3, and we, we have this exercise that we picked up from our friends at Tuff University that's called a silly walk. And a silly walk is where you take all the tires out of a, out of a robot kit, and then you're forced to build a robot outside of your traditional thinking. Because sometimes when we think of robots, we think of, you know, like our fun, fun double here with our friend Tina, or, you know, that it's got to be on wheels and move like Rosie from the Jetsons. But, but robots outside of it is, is anything that you can build and run autonomously or control. So we played, we worked with Lime Follows, and we had this entire pirate story. And the neat thing about the guys at IT Corps and Suriname and Theo and all his friends, I mean, they're marketing geniuses. They had seven different media outlets show up, four different television stations, and three different newspapers that interviewed these kids about all the awesome things that they're doing and talked about this pirate episode that they were working on. And so as we're traveling, I come back and I get in touch with my friend Arl, and Arl comes up to me and he says, hey, I've been looking for something to do in Cambodia. You know, my girlfriend's gonna go out there. She has an organization called Chroma Wheel, and what she does is she buys Cambodian scarves and pays a fair wage for these Cambodian women to stay in business. I sell them to Americans, and then we buy, with some of the profits, we buy uniforms for Cambodian children. I was like, this is awesome. This is so really exciting. And he says, I wanna work on something that's engineering-based and do some volunteer work while I'm there, maybe for a couple of days. I said, awesome. Well, let me get you in touch with my buddy Saveth and the guys at Point Airy Lee. And so this is Arl, our first ambassador, to go ahead and, and reach out you know, to, to an organization that we had already touched with, and he followed it up. And so it's neat how our worlds kind of merge together and work together. And so what's next for our organization as a whole is in June of this year, I'm going to head back to Vietnam. We're going to work with a different group in Sunflower Mission and, and possibly start a, a robotics program there. After that, we're doing this really cool initiative that I'm super excited about. And I want all of you guys to come because it's going to be a party. And so we're working with the Paramount Theater. And we wrote a curriculum for middle school students to write their own stories, program their own robots, and they're gonna sing and dance and act out plays that they created with robots that they programmed on the state theater stage on July the 31st. And it is gonna be a blast. So mark your calendar. After that, in September, we're gonna head back to Suriname and implement another series of teaching with IT Core. And then, and then we started a new partnership with our friends at the Miracle Foundation. And if you haven't worked with the Miracle Foundation before, they're amazing. Their goal is to bring the 12 rights of a children that were founded by the UN to orphanages all over India. And so this particular orphanage is getting a new computer, computer lab and to celebrate, we're gonna go and start them a robotics program and do science experiments and it's gonna be a blast. So through all of these travels, I wanted to tell you about the five universal truths that I've learned from robots and what robots have taught me. To begin with, we are all robots. Every single one of us in here. We are wonderful and we are all unique. We are directly influenced by the people around us, by the things we put into us, that we feed into us, through our eyes, through our ears. And there was a point in time where, you know, I think all of us kind of struggle with identity, at least I did. Maybe I was the only one that had teen angst you know, and didn't care for my family. And then you wake up one day and you're like 24 and you're like, oh my gosh, my parents were spectacular and they did so much for me. And so sometimes it takes a shift in our programming to wake up sometimes to what's happening in the world around us and how we're being supported. Number two, love process, process love, and allow failure. Even though I didn't get that STEM job that I really, really wanted, this amazing door and opportunity is just like swung wide open. That's an absolute blast. And sometimes we can look at things and say, oh, I, I completely failed. I missed out on that job. Or maybe I didn't get this opportunity that I really wanted. Or maybe this layout didn't turn out the way it should have been. Or maybe my robotics team didn't win this tournament. But if we're really standing on something awesome, it's not about whether we win or we lose, but it's about what we learn along the way. Number three, analog touch in a digital world. As we continue on with this adventure, 
I, I see our digital world only growing, right? I mean, just users and databases and statistics based on users and all this other kind of stuff and this handle here and that handle there. Take time to sit across from the people that you love and have a beer and drink some whiskey and chit chat and break bread. There's nothing, nothing will ever replace that. Just simply having a meal from the people you love and care about. We are all together in circuit. And the best part about living in the digital world that we are in, everyone's just a Skype phone call away. And these crazy people, Theo and Natalini, out in Suriname, we chat every other week. And our conversations start with like, what's happening? What's going on in the world? Theo asks Nicole and Andy about Connor, their child that they now have. You know, oh, and then you know, Nicole answers and we have a great time, but they, we're all a part of each other's lives. And then last but not least, we should celebrate, we should relate, and we should collaborate. So these people in this picture, I am related to. These crazy people. The guy in the back is my brother. This woman right here in the middle is my sister-in-law, Vanessa Kay. And then that's their daughter, Kenya, in the middle. On the outside, the screaming kid, who looks very similar to me, his name is Judah, and he is a blast. His brother is Anton on this side. Anton is wonderful and unique, and you have never seen a kid with so much joy. What's interesting about Anton is Anton is currently battling a disease that's called EB. EB is when you are at a loss of a protein called collagen number seven that holds the layer of your skin to your muscle. So when you and I walk and possibly hit the doorway we don't lose our skin, Anton would lose her skin. Anton would lose his skin, excuse me. And so right now he's currently at an experimental research study out in Minnesota with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Toller who's doing some amazing work. And so he had to go through chemotherapy recently. He was really disappointed. And so together as a group, we all decided to shave our heads so that we could support him. And it changed his attitude. I mean, you're talking about a kid who has absolute joy it's amazing that how something as, as little as hair can make you feel like you're a part of something. And so with that, one day as my dad and my brother are driving in the car, they're driving and Anton's sitting in his car seat and he starts complaining about how the bumps in the road are hurting his bottom because his skin is very different than ours. And immediately Judah chimes in and he tells my dad, my dad's grandpa name is Papa T. He says, Papa T, he says, I want to be an engineer when I grow up. My dad says, why? He says, because I want to make smooth roads so that way when Anton drives and rides on these roads, his bottom won't hurt anymore. And that's the kind of people I want to celebrate and relate with and collaborate with. I want to take imagination and I want to take logic and I want to make something awesome and new. So I'm going to close with this. Be bold, be awesome, and be robotic, and be amazing to the people that are around you. Thank you.